Okay, uh, great. Let's get started. I'm very happy to introduce Yang Liu today. He's a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. He's um, working with Yiling Chen and David Parks there. He, he got his PhD at uh, Michigan. He works on many things that uh, are related to things we work on here, like including uh, crowdsourcing information. Um, he's interested in incentivizing exploration. He has a paper on algorithmic fairness in a multi armband setting. So he, um, he has a lot of interests that cross over. He's actually visiting here for two weeks. Um, for, this, is the, this is the second week of his visit. He, he's also, let's see, uh, Jen is leading an effort at, uh, of a few of us here uh, who are advisors on an IARPA program on hybrid forecasting, like combining forecasting that combines human and machine intelligence. And, uh, one of our academic partners are David and Yiling, and Yang is working on that at Harvard, and so he's here for that reason. But right now, he's <laughs> giving a talk, uh, and interviewing for um, post -doc. a postdoc position. So thank you, Yang. Hi. Thank you, Dave. Um, can everyone hear me? Good. Uh, I, I heard from Jen like the first day, like there were too many job talks already. I, I didn't plan to add this one, but uh, thank you for coming. Uh, just I wasn't talking about you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just disclaimer, I, I didn't prepare the slides for a postdoc job talk. Uh, so the technical details may be at a relatively higher level. Uh, but I'll be here for another day and a half. So if you got interested in the details, come to me. I stay next to Dave. Right. So I, I'm going to be talking about several machine learning things, but all in the context of an incentive design question. It sounds like an econometric question, but uh, the goal of today is to convince you at the end. This question is uh, very well connected to a lot of questions in machine learning, and it can be very well solved using machine learning techniques. All right. To give you a broader picture, uh, my, the motivation of my research is really inspired by this connection between technology, like machine learning, with our people. Right. These days, machine learning is everywhere, it has been applied to many and many society-relevant applications. Like when I was making the job talk slides, it was not hard for me to find applications such as health in, health, in healthcare, like machine learning being helping doctors to make diagnosis, diagnosis decisions. And more recently, probably this is more controversially, machine learning has been applied to uh, in this domain of criminal justice decision making, helping judges to make bail decisions or sentence decisions. On the other direction, it's also true. Uh, the fast development of machine learning is also relying on a lot of contributions, a lot of inputs from our people. Here, I'm not even talking about the people in the room. I'm more talking about the general population. It's not machine learning researchers, general population. As this is a very fresh example from Facebook. When Facebook announced that they were mad about this uh, amount of fake articles, uh, Obviously, moderating the fake news is hard for these days machine learning techniques because it requires a cognitive reasoning at the human level, which is missing in many of these algorithmic design approaches. So as a first step, Facebook is going to pull data from users to help them detect whether an article is likely to be fake or not fake. So this is a one type of user, user input to the machine learning system. And this is an older example. So I'm here talking at Microsoft. I got to talk about prediction market. When you're building a forecaster or predictors to predict political events or some other events, uh, a concrete first step is to pull people's opinion from a general crowd. Right. So over the past many years, like probably more than 20 years, we've been spending a lot of time, a lot of efforts in developing more and more accurate machine learning algorithms. We aim for 99% accuracy. Like many times, even 99 is not accurate enough. So we add another 9 to the, obviously add another 9 is better. But, uh, but machine learning is really a full pipeline. You got data collection, flows into your algorithm, and then you apply the outcome. Uh, with more connections with people, I would say there are unique challenges arising from the front at the end. For instance, when you're applying outcome to people, uh, let's not talk about movie recommendation. Let's talk about healthcare. 
how do you make sure this application is taking good care of the bias in either the data or the model? You don't want people to be treated unfairly. Or when you're collecting data from people, this is not as easy as collecting data from a physical process because people can be strategic, people can manipulate, and people can be sloppy. Right. So my research in the past few years focused on addressing several challenges arising on the two ends. On the outcome part, I study algorithmic fairness. When we are applying machine learning outcomes to, uh, to applications relevant to people, how do we protect their fair chance of getting a good decision? I also studied data security. When we are pulling data from people, how do we better protect their privacy so people feel safe in terms, in terms of participating in the system? More recently, I studied incentive questions in machine learning. Uh, this is a very active project we've been building at Harvard. This talks about how do we use machine learning technique to build an incentive framework that can quantify the value of the information so we can incentivize people to give us more and more accurate data. Besides that, I also studied the post-processing procedure. After you collect the data, what is the best way to do aggregation so the machine learning system will benefit the most from this aggregation? <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the other part very briefly at the end, but today's focus is really on the incentive part. Uh, the outline is quite clear. I'm going to introduce what is, what is this question and how to formalize this question as incentive in machine learning. Uh, it's multiple papers, but it's really just one topic. How to use machine learning techniques to design incentive so we can acquire data from strategic agents. After that, I'm going to just briefly talk about, in practice, how do we do this sequentially in a more dynamic setting. I'll conclude the talk with future works. Right. Okay. Right. So what is the incentive in machine learning? I suppose I'm, like, I'm using Facebook. One day I woke up, there's a news popped on my timeline saying Google just bought Apple. Is this a fake news or not fake news? I, I didn't make this up. This, this news was actually viral like on Twitter several months ago. People were irritating about it. Suppose it shows on my dad, my mom, and myself's timeline. And we read the article. We have different observations. We have a different educational background. We can form different opinions. I, I call it, OK, it sounds right. Oh, it's a fake. And we have different opinions. My mom and dad, they have more time than me at this moment. And probably they're nicer people. So they're going to read the article, form their opinion, and tell Facebook, I think it's fake, or I think it's not fake. But my data may be missing because helping Facebook detect fake news is not one of my incentives to use Facebook. I don't have a reason to do it. Even worse, if Facebook asks me, you've got to tell us whether it's fake or not fake. Otherwise, we're going to disable your Facebook account for 15 minutes. The very easy thing for me to do is just randomly click on fake or not fake without even reading the article. That's the easiest thing for me to do. But as Facebook, now you couldn't tell the difference between these two data. Is this label coming from a thoughtful procedure, or is this data coming from a uh, random spamming procedure? Now, this phenomenon is pretty common. It's not very rare in many of these machine learning systems, especially when we are getting training labels, training data from Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, you lost the control of how much effort people put in, uh, how, how accurate people's labels are. Or you get the Uber rating. Like Uber is using a lot of rating data to do like route recommendation, like trip recommendation. But uh, when was the last time you gave a software review to Uber? I couldn't remember my last time giving a software review. Because I don't have, like, how accurate my reviews are does not affect my future business with Uber. I don't have incentive to do it. To summarize, all these applications, they have one thing in common. If you lost control of the quality of training data, if the data coming from different sources 
have different model noise embedded in the training data. The decision hyperplan you trained may be highly unpredictable or highly unreliable. Therefore, hardly you can say, even though the generalization error is very small, you achieve 99% accuracy, whether you are generalizing over a representative set of data or not is, is hard to say. Our goal, uh, our goal of this project is to incentivize people to report a higher quality data, so we're going to have a lot less bias in training a machine learning system. And we're going to build a scoring system. Right? We're going to build a scoring system that quantifies the value of the reported data. And the scores can be used in many different ways. You can use a score to pay people, or you can use the scores to build a reputation system to, 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 to drive people to participate and contribute a higher quality data. This is going to help us align the incentive for participation, giving us a thoughtful data, and also giving us more representative data. Again, this is another very timely article when I was traveling. I saw this article saying, like, now our data is very crucial for many AI applications. Shall we be paid for our data? Uh, I think I, my, my research, for many part of my research, I want to st strongly advocate the, the answer as yes, we should be paid. But the question is how? Like how, how do we pay people for their data? Uh, we, we want people to have a software data. We want them to choose for a report. And uh, we want to add a press tag to each of the data points. So people will be motivated to give us a good data versus bad data, because they create a difference in the, in the price they got. Right. So let's do this. How do, how, do, how do we formalize this question? So suppose you have n data to be labeled. You can imagine there are like n articles. They come, up, they come with a feature vector. So you can imagine the feature vector as uh, the source of the information. Like you can apply an LP to extract keywords from the articles, so on and so forth. How many times they got retweeted? Has a true label. According to some prior distribution, it has a true label with either yes or no. It's fake or not fake. This true label, we don't know. Right? We want to label this data. So I color things differently. Like If we lost in the, in the notation, everything I color in red means something we don't know, we don't observe. Everything that is colored in black means something we know. Okay. You assign the data to people, conditional on the ground truth, which we don't know. People have a different opinion. Like even though I put in a lot of effort, I still may not agree with the ground truth. People have different subjective belief. So this probability is 60%, 40%. This captures the inherent noise of people. And I call this people's data. Again, it's hidden. We don't know. What we know is the reported data or the collected data from people. And uh, the goal is very simple. We want the reported data to equal to the true data in people's mind. So we want them to truthfully report their belief in some way. Okay. Uh, I don't understand. This. What's the distinction between people's data and collected labels? People's data is, you can imagine, your true belief. Right. Like, I really read the article. I form my belief. I think it's a fake or not fake. Reported data is like anything I tell you. It could be coming from a software procedure, but it could be just like I randomly tell like, fake or not fake. It doesn't need to be equal to the as if true data in your mind. So uh, maybe I'm getting confused by what red means. So yes is in blue and red is no. Oh, you sorry. You observe yeses, but you don't observe noes. No, no, sorry. Uh, oh, this is bad notation. So uh, these are the ground truths. So the red color doesn't apply to the no. <laughs> so regardless of yes or no, ah, this, again. Where is that 60% versus 40% noise coming in? Is it between label and people's data, or it's data collected label? So this is between the ground truths and people's data. So like, say, if the ground truth is yes, 40% of the time, people will make a mistake. If ground truth is no, like 80% of the time, people will. The noise model is uh, homogeneous with ground confirmation. 
great. It's, it's heterogeneous. Different people have different error rates. Okay, yeah. But uh, I'm going to make assumption it's homogeneous across tasks. So I assume like for 10 articles, people roughly make similar model noise. Thumbs down is supposed to mean not fake. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> down meaning fake. Down means fake. Right. Up means not fake. But if it's, if it's not fake, then most people say it, that no means not fake, right? Right. So most people say it is fake when, you, when they say Right. It could be fake. possible. Yeah. Like, uh, it could be uh, the ground truth is in minority people's hand. It, it, I don't make assumptions that the majority of people get the ground truth. Okay. So it could be like there are some cases that are extremely hard. The ground truth is no, but the most people got it wrong. So it's possible. Yeah, there's a prior, so you can imagine. So you're kind of operating in a fully Bayesian setting. Bayesian setting, exactly. Yeah, this is a Bayesian structure question. All right. So this question has been studied in a much easier setting, which is called information elicitation, when it has ground truth. Right. And this question talks about how do you incentivize, or how do you price the data when you observe the ground truth information. That is, right, you know the true label. And how do you price people's data? How do you evaluate the people's predictions? Uh, you may you may wonder like if I know it's fake or not fake, why why do I still care about people's data? But for some other cases, like this is a question I've been carrying a lot in the past several months, like whether Boston is going to snow or not, like in, in the next three days. Uh, this help people to make travel plans. Uh, so this thing, this type of questions, you gotta know the ground truth after three days, so you can come back, press people based on this ground truth. And the solution is called strictly proper scoring rule. It has been studied for many, many years, probably for like more than 70 years, 60 years. Uh, the idea is, is quite elegant. It's quite uh, straightforward. So it's like I try to find a scoring function S that evaluates people's report using the ground truth Y such that if I truthfully report my data in my belief, I get a higher score than the case if I misreport. Okay. So now, if you have this score, it gives you the incentive property. Right? You can use the score to pay people differently. So if I know, if I truthfully report, I'm going to have a higher score. I have an incentive to report the data compared to, uh, compared to sending spam data. There exist many, many scoring functions that can do this. For binary signals, you're asking yes or no. This one over prior uh, scoring function basically checks whether people's report matches ground truth or not, normalized by the popularity of this answer. This will do it. If you're asking for more, you're asking for the probabilities, how likely the article is fake. You're asking for a continuous number, this prior score, is going to do it. Essentially, it checks out how much you misreported, uh, you missed reporting the ground truth. Right? It's a quadratic loss form of this reporting. Uh, this actually is quite similar to the quadratic loss function in machine learning, which is a connection I'm going to talk later. So this is an indicator function. No, but on the second line. Or is that product? Oh, this, uh, so now it's a probabilities. So this is a sort of vector. Like how much probability you allocate on each of the outcomes. Uh, I, just, I think it's a naive question, but so ground truth is known here. Are you taking into account the fact that people just might be wrong? It might just be a hard thing. Right. So ground truth is known here. This might just be hard for generally for people to be. Is that the intuition that like even though ground truth is known, just looking at whether they match is not enough because it depends on the question that you're asking. Them. Right. So that's why you are normalizing by the prior. So that's the popularity. Of the, if the question is extremely hard, like meaning this prior is very low, so you're gonna reward people more. Yeah, the assumption is the world is not colluding against you somehow. Right. Yeah. That's that's about right. Good. 
Well, the challenge is it doesn't apply to our setting because it's uh, not possible to verify the ground truth. As for the labeling case, you don't know the ground truth label. For pure grading or pure review, you don't know the true quality of the article or you don't know the true quality of the homework. And also, if you ask questions like, will people land on Mars by 2030, you just don't know the ground truth answer until 12 years later. Noticing this challenge, there has been a line of research called jointly called peer prediction that was proposed. It's a family of mechanism that can truthfully incentivize people to report uh, the private signal in mind at equilibria. So it's a, it's a game theoretical solution, meaning if I believe everybody else is truthfully reporting the data, it is also my best interest to truthfully report. The idea is very simple. You don't have a ground truth to verify the data. You're going to assign each data to two people, and at least two people, and use their answers to cross-validate or cross-check each other. And you're going to reward people or score people based on how each report correlates with another. Often, under some conditions, you try to prove Truthful reporting is equilibrium, so that's a goal. Uh, don't take me wrong. I really, I really like peer prediction research, and uh, many of the co-authors there are like are my heroes. Uh, I can talk for hours, like what are the good things about peer prediction, but uh, since I only have half an hour left, I'm going to tell you what are the caveats and how how we want to fix it. So first of all, uh, this, uh, this notion, this solution notion is built on equilibrium, meaning I need to assume everybody is rational. But in practice, when you implement this mechanism, people can easily ask the question, do I trust other people to follow in Nash equilibrium or not? And in practice, uh, we often say the answer is no. We just heard this uh, launch talk. Uh, saying many times people can be strategic and they don't really, form the, they don't really follow the equilibrium strategy. And even worse, in pure predictions, there exists multiple equilibria. So this creates a lot of strategic manipulation. In practice, people can ask, which equilibrium do other people follow? And this is not easy to coordinate among a large uh, population of crowd. Instead, we want a dominant truthfulness, meaning regardless of how other people play, we want to have a scoring system that is always your best interest to report your data truthfully, so to reduce this cognitive reasoning load. Second main caveat is like peer prediction checks on correlation. It doesn't really calibrate the value of the information. Right? Consider example, you're applying, this is the reason why peer prediction fails for peer grading or peer review cases. I suppose I need to review the article by tomorrow, but I'm running out of time. So I can easily, instead of reading the proofs, I can say, okay, it's a long article with a lot of mathematics. So the chance of good article is, a chance of being good article is good. So I say it's a good article. And, uh, I'm not suggesting this is the right way to do it, but uh, people can form this signal. Uh, this signal, I call it a cheap signal, because it's so cheap, I believe everybody else should observe it too. And this type of signal has low qualities. It doesn't reflect the quality of the article, but it has higher correlation compared to the signal, I read the article, I read the proof, I found that the proof is not trivial. In that case, I need to believe every other reviewer's also read the article, read the proof, and agree with me, the article is not trivial. And reporting the chip signal is always a better strategy. It costs less, but it gives you a higher correlation. We don't want that. We want a scoring system that calibrates the exact amount of information in the report. There are some other caveats, but I want to keep in mind these two things are the main things we want to solve in the next 10 minutes. So in the past two years, we built this uh, machine learning framework. We found this question can be probably only be solved using machine learning techniques. We don't know the other ways of solving it. Uh, and we built a framework that is, that to some degree, we prove is able to do it. We decided to take, in, take a kind of different view, viewpoint compared to peer prediction, which checks on the correlation. And, uh, my idea was mainly inspired by this single equation I showed you earlier. For strict proper scoring rule, this very beautiful equation gives you the incentive property. But we don't have the ground truth, so it's not, applic not applicable here. 
Uh, well, I was talking to Yilin, we were asking, instead of knowing the ground truth, can we predict on the ground truth? Can we take one step back, saying can we predict on the ground truth? It's not super trivial, but the answer is partially yes. You can use machine learning, right? A big part of machine learning is to predict. We know the feature vector. Suppose you can construct, can find a classifier. This classifier will map the feature vector to a prediction of the ground truth. Then the question is, can we just apply ground truth with the machine learning algorithm to the strict proper scoring rule and make it happen? The answer is no, because it's not ground truth. The predictor introduces bias, unless it's a perfect predictor, which is unlikely to happen in practice. But the next question is, can we remove the bias? This sounds like another machine learning question. Removing the bias in the data is kind of, is kind of interesting to a lot of machine learning researchers. Can we do that? Instead of having instead of using strict proper scoring rule S, can we find a bias removal procedure that removes this bias? So still, you're gonna have a, you're gonna roughly have as if you know the ground truth. I'm gonna, I, I gonna explain it later. But the idea is we want to remove the bias. What's the difference between the two sides of the inequality? Two sides, that is, uh, okay. yeah, this is, uh, the right side is like you, you don't report truthfully. Right. If the machine learning right. So if the machine learning uh, outcome is unbiased, you can just plug in. It's very simple to show how the results will hold. But the case is, is if what if it's biased? So you said previously that the noise model between y and y equal uh, can differ from like person to person. Right. right. Distribution over Y and distribution over Y to be completely like, unrelated? Oh, good point. The question is can I allow people's data to be completely unrelated to the ground truth? Right. That's the only corner case. If people's data is in entirely independent of the ground truth, yeah. we cannot learn anything. Right. So, in that case, nothing, can be done. nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's called stochastic relevance in this setting. We got to assume the signals is at least informative in some way. I see. So it will come as an assumption later. Right. Yeah. Right. So the goal is to have a function R takes people's input. Still, people choose for report. You get a higher score. But you don't have ground truth. We're going to use machine learning. The input of machine learning is whatever data you collected from other people. So we don't, we don't assume people are truthful reporting, so there's no requirement of the reporting procedure. So it's not an equilibrium argument. Right, so I'm gonna tell you how to do machine, lear machine learning predictions. Uh, notice, because this input is noisy information. We only have information from people. So how do you learn a good classifier? And I'm gonna tell you how to do scoring function, combining these two things. Uh, it almost happens every single time when I talk about two things, like people thought about it, saying like, you, got, you need to know how much noise in people's report, but you don't know the ground truth, how do you learn that? I'm gonna tell you how to learn the error, the amount of error in people's report, even though you don't know the ground truth. All right, how to do machine learning predictions? So for each user, I, you have a set of training data, which I denote as XJ, YJ report, and this could be very noisy because it's not, it simply it's not ground truth, right? So conditional on the ground truth, people's report can be very different from the ground truth. But let's characterize with two parameters, what I call E plus, E minus. So these are the true negative rates and the false positive rates. Doing risk minimization doesn't seem to work because if you are just doing regression or doing classification, like training procedure over this data, it's not correct, because this Y report is simply not Y. It's a noisy copy of the ground truth. You are minimizing or you are generalizing the, over the wrong loss functions. So the idea is to define unbiased surrogate loss. 
to remove the noise. So this is uh, some idea that has been in machine learning literature for some time. Instead of L, can we find a loss function phi takes input, takes noisy report as an input, such that when you take expectation, A equals the true loss in an unbiased way. Right. So you don't need to know the ground truth label, but you have an unbiased estimation of this loss. Then you can solve it. Instead of doing risk minimization, you can do surrogate risk minimization. And by a lot of large number, the summation converges to ex expectation, which is equal to the true loss. Okay. The idea is very simple. Now I'm showing you a lens equation uh, for two purposes. You don't need to raise the equation. First, it's doable. Uh, this is just one example. There exist several other uh, surrogate loss functions that can remove this bias. Secondly, the definition of the surrogate loss depends on the error rates. You need to know the error rates, right? It makes sense. You're removing the noise. You got to understand how much noise is in the data. Otherwise, it sounds too much magic. Sorry, third point. I said two, but third one. Uh, it's, it goes back to the ninth question. What if the data is entirely irrelevant? That corresponds to the condition E plus plus E minus equals one meaning this is not well defined. So for that quarter case, you couldn't learn anything. Go ahead. So can you use some expressions for why it's even possible to do this? Right, so why is it even possible? The idea is... Uh, what exactly and why is it possible? Why is it possible to so do this? I mean like in a non-quarter case. Right. Yeah. So uh, I guess the question is like, why is it possible to remove the bias? which itself seems like it could be as hard as the general problem itself, right? Right, yeah. So I just want to know why it somehow got easier. So why, why I can estimate the noise? Yeah. I'm, I'm right. I can tell you. Uh, so that's the last part of this uh, section. So can you like, bear with me for now? Like, suppose you can learn the error rates for now. Okay. Uh, but that's I'm, somehow easier than learning the, than the original thing you were trying to do. Right. Was, okay, In some sense. Right. Great. So we already noticed already. So this is the earliest one that ever happened to me. You need to, you need to know the error rates in order to do this learning. Go ahead. Um, is there an assumption that the error rates are less than a half? Good point. So is there an assumption the error rates is less than half? It's on the next slides. Okay. It doesn't need to. Uh, so we need to know the error rates, but to make life easier, we first show, first of all, you don't need to know the exact error rates. You only need to know the noisy error rates. Makes sense. Just do sensitivity analysis. Secondly, even though the error rate is more than half, you can still learn it. Very intuitively. So if you trust me, I'm going to tell you how to learn the error rates. Now, you have a report and you have a prediction, which is when you have a lot, lot of data, it's converging to the optimal one, which we assume is, is informative in some ways. The so next question is how to combine these two numbers. Uh, I'm going to give you high-level intuition, like what we are doing, like how, 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 why we think this result is, is important. There are like two areas of study, like why is information elicitation using scoring rule, and another is machine learning. Uh, the left-hand side, information elicitation has been studied for a longer period of time. It's, it's, it has a little bit richer literature. Well, like recent growth in machine learning is much more faster, but in terms of time horizon, this question has been studied much, much earlier. And people have been wondering about the connection of these two literature because both studies care about evaluating a information. Right? A scoring function evaluates the information from people. Machine learning evaluates the information from a classifier, evaluates how well the classifier performs. In the ideal world, we know the ground truth. This connection has been established. To many degrees, scoring functions are equivalent to loss functions. If you can remember the Breyer score, the quadratic loss score I showed you earlier, it's actually corresponding to exactly the quadratic loss in machine learning. This is good because now whatever scoring function you have in that literature can be transformed into a loss function in machine learning. So that's why this result is, was exciting for people. But for the cloudy world, when you don't know the ground truth, is there a connection? We have a scoring function that scores people without ground truth. We have a loss function that 
do machine learning without a perfect label? Do the two things collide with each other? We didn't solve, any, we didn't solve everything, but uh, we give preliminary evidence showing there is also a connection. Formally, the third loss function we proved can serve as a scoring function. I'll give you the intuition. You have a, you have a scoring function that you're aiming for takes input as report classifier. You have a surrogate loss function, takes input as classifier and the noise label. Right? You, don't have the, you don't have the perfect label. The classifiers stay the same. The report can be reinterpreted as a noisy ground truth. Next we prove maximizing the reward equals to minimizing the loss. The only thing you need to play with is these two parameters. A truthful reporting gives you optimal loss because the bias is removed. It's classifier converting to the optimal classifier. Any deviation gives you a suboptimal loss. That is something you can prove, which finish the proof. Is your question like I'm looking for square loss also? It's very general. For it all only need to be classification calibrated. It doesn't need to be square loss only. But this idea can be taken even further or deeper. This gives you a recipe saying there's a way to remove bias and score a function with noisy ground truth and to recover the true value in expectation. And this is a really powerful idea. And we already know there's another recipe, how to score information when you have the ground truth that is called strictly proper scoring rule. Uh, combining these two things, we were really hoping to uh, br bring up a whole family of scoring functions that what we call surrogate scoring function, which takes noisy ground truth, noisy input, but recover the true proper score in expectation. This will be good, because once you have this, all the nice properties you have for strictly proper scoring rule will hold for the noisy case. Expectation is taking over people's subjective belief and the noise in this noise label. Is it, is it marginalizing X or conditional on X? It's marginalizing over X. Great point. So we know scoring rule has been studied. There are many different family of scoring rules to elicit different type of information in the ideal world when you have the ground truth. But again, the cloudy world, when you don't have the ground truth, there's relatively less results to be known. And the surrogate scoring rule really gives you a bridge that shapes every single scoring function here to the noisy world. It doesn't depend on the specific form of the scoring function. And how to do it? There's a very simple example. Fairly noisy ground truth. Either ask people or use machine learning. In the lens equation I showed you earlier, replace loss function with a strictly proper scoring function. It removes the bias. And now the two properties we were aiming for can both achieved, be achieved. Because we know in strictly proper scoring rule, it's always best to report truthfully. And this is true here. And also, reporting a low quality signal is not good. Because we know it's, the proof is very intuitive, but the idea is we know strict proper scoring rule rewards accuracy. So the more accurate you are, the higher score you get. But it's all based on this single equation.
Uh, it doesn't depend on they. They is like depending on the outcome, but it's like E plus plus E minus. So both of them are there. Uh, instead of proving all the properties of it, I'm going to show you like the project, very exciting project to me, Dave mentioned earlier. So this is a hybrid forecasting computation. Uh, we got like 0.7 K participants. We are hoping to build a platform that incentivizing people to come make a forecast about some geopolitical events, like whether Bashar will cease to be the president of East, uh, Syria before January 2019. So this is a system we built. It's, it's very rough. Uh, it's more complicated than this. But the idea is like we want to have a platform. People come, raise a question, form their belief. It's like how likely this is going to happen. They tell us the forecast. We do aggregation. And this aggregated prediction will be evaluated. There's a machine learning part that helps, that helps us to do the aggregation. We don't want to just add up people's predictions. There's, there's also another machine learning block. After we evaluate people's answers, we want to do recommendation. We want to say like which people is better at which question. So this is like collaborative filtering type of works. We want to like push the most relevant question to the most relevant people. So first of all, you need the incentive to incentivize people to come. So surrogate scoring rule can be applied here to score people over the time. It, they don't need to wait until the last day to see their scores. And because surrogate score is unbiased in expectation, it actually can serve as the calibrated weights to do aggregation. Over time, you're going to know whose data is more informative than the others. So you can use this as a weight to do weighted aggregation. And this feedback loop was not, was not possible without surrogate scoring rule because the collection of training data is really slow. You need to wait until 2019 to see the performance of people. But now, the scores are unbiased. So you can give them unbiased feedback before the last day to make it happen. Right. So now I'm going to tell you how to, do the error, how to learn the error rates in order to do the scoring. With the example you gave, where like you want to review a paper and either it's right. really long or, or you actually read the proofs, so suppose that like the machine learning classifier that I'm using is like overly simple. It's like a decision stump or something, and the only feature it gets to look at is like the length of the article. So then it seems like you're going to basically overly reward people who agree with the hypothesis right. class. Good. That's a good question. So. The question is, like, what if the machine learning classifier is simply rewarding people according to the length of the article? Uh, in that case, like, the scoring system will fail. So you got to like, uh, make sure that machine learning classifier is complicated enough so people don't really know which feature is really playing what role in this classifier. If I know like, the exact weights in the classifier, then I can just report according to the classifier. I don't need to do my work. That's a great question. So I need to make it so everything is a Bayesian. Meaning, like, uh, it's prior free. I don't have specific belief about the classifier. So I just take, I only know the classifier's performance in general, but I don't know the specific dimensions of this classifier. Right. So, how do you learn the error rates like E plus, E minus in people's report, even though you don't know the ground truth? Uh, Again, a disclaimer. I, we thought this was new, but uh, after I give several times this talk, like there's some statistician mentioned, it's like it, it's actually quite similar to some high order moment generating function type works. But uh, let me still talk about it anyway. So you don't know. Like people give you like yes or no. You don't know how many times they make a mistake. But there's one equation you can know that is how often they give you a plus that you can observe. And this number can be written as function of e plus e minus. Right? The first term, p, is a prior. Like, among 10 articles, how many of them are fake? Like, 50% of them are fake, or 50% are not fake. So this is like, prior is plus. 1 minus c is you got it correctly, so it's plus. 1 minus p is wrong, and you got it wrongly, c minus. So it's still plus. Right? So you have this equation. And you can you can stacking up this, 
this, this, the other's equation, saying now I'm asking two people. They, how often they agree with each other is a plus label. This is also observable. And uh, the first term is simply is plus, and both people got it correctly, or it's a minus, and both people got it wrongly. So you have a second order equation. Now you have two equations, two animal variables. You can potentially solve it. Great. They don't have they don't have the same e plus and e minus. So e plus and e minus as average of the crowd. Uh, so that's why it's approximation. Because if you draw two people, the average differs by one people. But uh, if you have n people, the difference is bounded by one over n. So I'm going to show you some complex data bound. But you have two solutions, because the other is two for this equation. Uh, I, I saw that we couldn't tell the day from night, but uh, it, it turns out if you just do three people checking out how often three people agree with each other, this gives you a third order moment equation, and they will do it. Meaning the three matching equation uniquely defines the error rates, even though majority people got it wrong. So this, this is an experiment saying like 75% of the time, 75% of the time people got it wrong. We can still learn that majority of people are wrong with this equation. Um, you can imagine like when you can learn more and more accurately, this truthfulness I showed you earlier for the clean case well preserved for the noisy case. We recently have some solvers that's showing combining these three equations with bearing inference. You can learn the state of the world faster uh, in a more complex, in a more complicated way. We also have some real experiment on Amazon Turk, but uh, I, I guess I'll skip. The idea is like the surrogate score is is unbiased in expectation, but the people may interest may be interested in how fast it converges to the to the truth, like how much the variance affect the scoring. Um, roughly, like with more than 500 data, it converges to a kind of a safe region of the scores. So the the blue curve is a true score, a strict, as if we are using the ground truth, and the red curve is a surrogate score, we are, which we are using the noisy ground truth. All right. So um, running out of time, I'm gonna briefly mention a sequential setting because. The so one I talked to you earlier is like you have a lot of data, you train a classifier, you score people at once. But what if the data arrives sequentially? Uh, this will break this assumption. You have enough data to get a good classifier. And how do you do this? Um, the idea is like instead of scoring, we can use another dimensional incentive, which is called dynamic assignment. Instead of paying people the exact amount of money they deserve, we can show we keep we keep we give fixed payment. But uh, your future assignment, whether you're going to get the job or not, depends on the past quality. If your quality is higher, you're, you'll be more likely to be given the task. So this gives another dimension of the incentive. Uh, the goal is like still we have, I'm going gonna, gonna to omit all the details, but the goal is like you have n data to label. They arrive sequentially over time. And we want to incentivize people to give it good effort. Time is discretized, like t equal to one to capital T. The goal is to maintain a reputation score for each of the worker, so we know who is roughly doing better than others. And each time we're gonna select a worker or some workers according to the reputation score. So this will give the incentive. If I know my reputation score reflects my qualities, if my reputation score is higher, I will be more likely to be selected. And once this question, I, sound, I found this question is very similar to a question that is called mountain bandit. You have uh, options. You don't know their qualities. You want to select the best one over time. Uh, this, this is a classical question in exploration versus exploitation. Uh, there exist many solutions, but this one looks exactly what we want because this UCB solution costs, you give it optional index that consists of two parts. The first part is the empirical reward by selecting this option, uh, which is exactly a reputation score. If you imagine this option is a, is a people. And the second term is a confidence bound. It's evaluating how confident you are in this estimation. Right? So this looks just as a reputation score. Uh, we know it's locked regret. We have a lot of experts in this room, so I'm not going to tell the details. 
However, if we want to do this, there's a challenge. If we take each people as they arm, we want to select one of them or multiple of them, there's a question of how do you evaluate the quality of the people because we don't have the ground truth label. And how much effort people put in is hidden. You don't know. You only have partial observation. You don't know the ground truth. Uh, the qualities are strategically decided. There's multiple challenges in order to apply spend day setting. But I told you how to, how to evaluate the data when you don't have the ground truth. So we studied this scoring rule based UCB. It's very simple. Just replace the reward using scoring function R I showed you earlier. Now each people's data is going to be evaluated by the scoring function with another machine learning model. So in the paper, we study a regression model. So in this case, it's just a regression parameter. We learn from other people's data. Uh, was there a question? OK. The idea is very straightforward, but there's a technical challenge, because now each people's index is depending on other people's data, because you are using other, other arms data to make an evaluation. So there are, the multiple learning processes are coupled with each other. So this gave us a technical challenge. And each arm's observation is going to affect other arms. So this, this is another level of challenge. But nonetheless, I don't, I don't have time to go through the proof, but uh, agents putting the optimal effort level that you, 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 have, you have in mind is going to be a approximate Bayer Nash equilibrium, meaning they can manipulate this long-term system, but they will not gain by too much. This gain is at most is bounded by square root log t divided by t, which goes to zero as t goes large. Uh, worth to mention, we extend this uh, bandit setting into a partial observation setting with strategic people. So that, that is a contribution we found to be interesting. Right. Uh, we have like nonlinear regression, machine learning, other simple machine learning models that, that will be covered by these results too. And we also have privacy preserver setting because we are talking to some people. This could be useful in terms of building reputation market. Uh, people are saying, but you are using other people's data to score other pe to score each of the agent. Uh, people may infer how other people are doing, like the information from other people. But we can do a private setting for that. Right. So I have uh, done some other works like algorithmic fairness I mentioned earlier. I mainly did some work on again in the sequential decision making setting when people come like like me, like come with my resume looking for a job. Like how do you treat these people fairly in terms of their true qualities? Uh, and we are also studying this uh, project at Harvard. We are studying like when you're training linear classification, how do you add fairness constraints to the training procedure? Uh, we build a data breach system to forecast data breaches. It's actually running in FICO's credit score system. Like to tell, it's a, it's a measurement study. Like we are measuring the risk uh, behavior of different organizations and try to make up a scoring system. Uh, this uh, is quite interesting to me, like how when you have a wisdom crowd, but can you get a better wisdom crowd? Like from the big crowd, can you learn a smarter but a smaller crowd from this data? Who uh, It's my PhD advisor at Michigan. <laughs> uh, not myself. It's not my decor. <laughs> Right, so I want to build a computational framework with society in the loop. I want to quantify. I am super inter I, I'm interested in machine learning, but I'm also super interested in human intelligence. Uh, at the same time, I want to address societal c issues like incentive, fairness, and security. These are all relevant. Uh, I am particularly interested. I study a lot of sequential works, so it's like uh, I, I care about the consequence instead of outcome. I, I mean, I care about outcome too, but uh, I'm more interested in like how the outcome today will affect the evolution of the system or the consequences of tomorrow. Uh, I can use two minutes to go through like several typical to topics. Like one thing I'm really excited right now is like to use human intelligence, especially when a wisdom crowd can fail. How to use the, how to pull people's data with machine learning to detect fake news. Uh, it's uh, this is a recent article saying science of the fake news. I'm coding a sentence saying like people need to be incentivized to to give you informative answers. Uh, I see one of the authors in the room. So uh, this is a recent article. Let's do that. 
Uh, also, I want to study behavior models. Like uh, as I showed earlier, as I was arguing earlier, nobody is really fully rational, and nobody really believes that everybody else is fully rational. So, what what would be a good behavior model to start with to revise many of the decision making systems? Uh, I don't have time to talk about the figure, but uh, some experiment I did with actually Ming many years ago to show people don't really react to to money in the in the rational way. So I want to study like how people react to different actions. Uh, this another project we are doing like what we call Ferris machine to parallel with a moral machine project at MIT. Uh, we want to study like since there are 21 definitions. Of fairness in machine learning, which fairness definition is more fair? Right? Like, we want to understand the social norm. Uh, we are cross-sourcing this task. We are transferring the definition into different problem settings and ask people to pick which one they feel is more fair compared to the others. So we're going to do aggregation to show what is the social norm in many sense. Uh, I want to study like safe exploration for autonomous system. Uh, suppose you are building a robot using reinforced learning. Uh, we don't want robot to learn that is uh, when you are delivering a package, the best way is to throw the package and claim I delivered. That would be that would be too bad for us. And also in self-driving car, you don't want the AI to say, "Okay, in emergency, I should save myself or save the driver," and claim I tried to brake but it didn't work. So how do we? How 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 can I be careful uh, in terms of? Uh, Putting a safe objective function in the reinforced learning setting or any autonomous learning setting. Uh, all right, I just want to acknowledge my advisors and authors. Uh, WL. Again, I'll be here for the day and a half, so feel free to ask me questions. Thank you.